Hey everyone, uh, I just uh, I decided to make this video to explain what's been happening in my life these last few months. Uh, I got my laptop here, I, I wrote it all out. It's very long and to, to be honest, I'm just not very good at, at uh, speaking extemporaneously without a script. It's just not. Uh, some other YouTube content providers are able to do that. I'm not. This is going to be a very long video, but uh, I think it could be valuable to many people out there, so I hope you'll consider watching it through the, uh, throughout, um, watching the whole thing. <clears throat> Alright, uh, in, uh, in May of 2015, I took in a friend and allowed her to rent my spare bedroom. It did not seem like that big of a deal. I had done it once before, and it went very well, and she was in need. She and her father had just lost her home. It quickly got weird, though. She kept letting her father stay in her room with her, uh, even when I had told them that was not acceptable. I would just come home, or just I would hear, or I would just pass by the room, and I would hear him in there. She, she, I think she was trying to sneak him in. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I got the feeling that he planned to move in there completely. He kept, he was promising, "I swear, you won't know I'm here," which made it even weirder. Trust me. Ah, so, since my parents, in a sense, work in real estate, I had them draw up a rental agreement for me, which included the provision to not allow any authorized, unauthorized guests. I had also stated that the rent will stand at $200 per month, paid every first Monday of the month, which is really the bare minimum to offset the cost of her, of her living there. Uh, honestly, the room in my house is worth at least twice that. Uh, I had been getting I had been getting paid sporadically the first six weeks she was living there a few odd payments of random values that totaled up to about one hundred twenty dollars. Uh, the debt of uh, two hundred eighty dollars for the first two months was never repaid, but at least the following two hundred dollar payments came in full and on time. We got along fairly well. I did catch her dad uh, catch her dad sleeping in in her room a couple more times, but after that. I thought I gotten them to I had gotten them to understand that that was not allowed. The lease was scheduled to end on January first, twenty sixteen, but she didn't leave. She said she was unable to fill a security deposit until a federal grant came in towards the end of January. January, I was not happy. Neither were the co-owners of my house, my parents, but we decided to allow her lease to default to while she attended to her finances. I did not take any money because I did not want to legitimize her withholding of my property. It was easy enough to ignore. My final semester had started and I was spending most days on campus ranging from 10 to 16 hours working on my final projects. However, the beginning of February came and went and she had not moved out. She had packed a couple of boxes but did not seem to make any effort to leaving, so I confronted her about it. Her winter quarter had started at the University of California, Davis. She said that she could not focus on moving right now because it would hurt her performance in school and she would leave in late March. I was understandably frustrated with this response. I understood her concerns all too much, but I felt annoyed that she would make this decision so casually without even consulting me, and I told her that she needs to work on pl her pluralities. So she filled another box of her stuff. I should have known what she was really like, but I pitied her. She had far less resources to her name, and her father is a weird, crazy guy. March came, and she packed up a large amount of her stuff, and it seemed like she was finally going to come through. When the 1st of April came and went, however, I realized I had to take action, and she, that she probably never intended to leave until I did so. I think that she was just making a show of preparing to leave, uh, just to prevent me from taking action as long as possible. So I filed an eviction. It took several days to process the paperwork, and she wasn't even served until the 18th of April. She had two weeks to respond, or the sheriff would come and lock her out of my house. However, she did respond. She filed court documents claiming unlawful eviction, and a court date was set with her as a defendant, and my, my parents and myself as a plaintiff. As I am sure you are aware, the court process can be very slow, but they managed to fit us in on May 23rd, about two days after my college graduation and I had to continue to live with her until then. The trial was quite an event. As the plaintiff, it was our right to go first. Our lawyer started off by bringing my tenant to the stand and questioning her. Essentially, every single thing she said was completely orthogonal to reality. 
The defendant's entire case rested on two things, lampooning my character and two receipts. Our lawyer started out by inquiring on the circumstances of how she met me and why she asked to move in with me. We met at Sacramento City College in 2010, and I allowed her to move in because she was evicted from the house she grew up in. She said that while at first the reason I took her in was out of altruism, she, but uh, she soon decided that I had ulterior motives. Namely, that I wanted her to be my girlfriend. She listed several awkward adolescent acts I supposedly did, such as constantly hugging her. She said that she would find me outside of her bathroom when she finished taking a shower. You know, crap like that. The ironic thing about this story is the fact that at the time of her move-in, until late last November, she was dating another woman that she met online. She made several other odd accusations. She's a Catholic and had known for a long time that I'm an atheist. She's even seen several of my videos. Uh, she told the court that I'm a radical atheist. Yes, that's right. She actually tried to use the fact that I'm an atheist against me in court. It does not matter that I celebrate Hanukkah and Passover over with my family. I'm just a radical atheist. She's, uh, she is half black. Her father is white and her late mother was black. And she said that I'm, ra I'm, I'm racist and I accused her of stealing a toolbox. I had no idea what she meant by that, but I later realized she must have been referring to my missing electronics repair kit. I could not find it last year, and I asked her if I had left it in one of the drawers in my wraparound desk that I have in her room, but she said it was not there. She has a lot of stuff in there, <clears throat> even after she packed up a bunch of boxes, and I commented that I looked everywhere and suspected I would probably find it in her room once she packed up, because that was where I last remember using it, just, uh, just before she moved in. I had created some of the footage for the NES dissection video. Uh, but I never once accused her of stealing it. I just thought it was lost in there, and she didn't see it. <coughs> However, when things started going downhill, uh, things I was expecting to get in the mail did disappear. The, my new camcorder that I was going to replace this one with, uh, a, a, a Wii console I had ordered for a friend, a replacement taillight for my van, and even my, my renewed driver's license. I never accused her of stealing them, but I did have to put a watch on my identity. And to tell you the truth, I have a homeless drug addict that sometimes camps out in my side yard, and my neighbors down the street actually burgled my house three times in, within a six-month period in 2012. So there's no reason to immediately believe it was my tenant or her dad. Uh, sorry. She said that she paid me $200 at the beginning of every month on time, and like I said, that isn't true. She never paid me the $280 for... May and or part of May and June. She always paid me in cash. She falsely claimed that she had re claimed that she repeatedly requested that I provide her with receipts and had always refused doing during re re refused to do so during the run of the lease. I had given her a 60-day notice of non-renewal, which I taped to her door and photographed with my phone on November 2nd, and I had told her that she would be receiving it in mid-October. However, however, when she was presented with a copy of the notice, she dramatically slammed her head on the table and proclaimed that she had never seen that before in her life. She said that I had, hadn't, <coughs> I had not informed her that the lease was ending. Uh, she said that I only informed her the lease was ending verbally, no, uh, and uh, not until mid-December. We, when we arrived at the end of the lease, uh, she was asked why she did not leave. She said that she was not financially ready to leave the house. And uh, really, the, 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 the notice of non-renewal did not matter. There's no legal obligation to give one. The fact that it's plainly said in the lease that, the, that it was to end January 1st, 2016, is all that was, that's, that's necessary. A notice of non-renewal is just helpful. It's just, it's, just, it's just extra. Now, the crutch of this case hinges on whether or not the lease had changed to month to month after it ended on the 1st of January. If she had paid me any money after the 1st of January, that would definitely have made the lease month to month, and that would have made it a lot harder, harder to get her out. So she presented a receipt that she claims I produced and gave her, which simply stated that I had received $200 from her on January 4th, 2016. It had my signature on it, but I had never created or even seen it until the day of the trial. She also received a, a she, she, saw, she also said, she also had a receipt dated the 5th of April, 
which was after the eviction had already been started. She did not have anything for February or March, and both of those receipts were not originals anyways, but she had an explanation for that. She said that uh, she had to take the January and April to the Finance Department of University of California, Davis, for them to adjust her financial aid, and they made copies. Which actually brings up an interesting point I didn't write here, but if she did present those receipts to UC Davis, to, and they adjusted her, her aid based on the, on <coughs> the money that, she's, that she uh, falsely claims that she paid me, then she's guilty of defrauding the school and the state of California. Uh, and if I if I really had the time to deal with this, I I would I would uh, I would actually pursue that. I might, I would consider contacting UC Davis and seeing what they have to say about that. <clears throat> but I don't, and I'll get into that later. I uh, anyway. <clears throat> uh, as far as the original four receipts that she claims that I gave her, the story went that sometime in April she came home and found her room had been rooted through. She claims that I had realized the receipts could be used against me in court, so I broke into her room and stole them. But she still had the copies of January and April for some reason. Our lawyer was pretty smart. He used that classic strategy of letting out enough rope for her to hang herself with. She asked her to describe the situation in which I presented her with the receipts for each month. And uh, which is something she obviously had to come up with on the spot because those that because that never happened. I never presented her with receipts because I never received any money. And uh, her her stories did not make much much sense. The weirdest one was the April was the April one. She said that I was already sitting at my home computer uh, in the kitchen when she got home. She walked into the, to the kitchen uh, and presented me with the money. And then I thanked her and gave her the receipt that was already printed and signed and had it next to me. Why would I have a receipt with me signed and dated on a random day? Plus. It was on a Tuesday, and on Tuesdays, I never got home a minimum earlier than 9 a.m., and that was unusual when I would leave early, when I would leave early enough to get home at 9. Tuesdays and Mondays were, my, were usually my latest days of, uh, during that week, during, during the semester. <clears throat> <clears throat> the whole idea that I even gave her receipts after the lease had ended, made no sense at all. She obviously only created those to try to try to uh, make the make it more likely that the that the lease was month to month because it's a lot harder to get somebody out who's on their month to month lease. Uh, so th that was one of our lawyer's main points. That was what they kept repeating throughout. He asked her why he, she thought I started giving her receipts after nine months without any receipts. She said that, that she thinks I have a guilt, because I did it out of a guilty conscience. That uh, I'm a very lonely, very depressed, no, very lonely, very depressing man, and felt so bad about how I had treated her that I gave her receipts for rent when I wanted her to leave. Like I said, it did not make much sense, and our lawyer highlighted that later at the end in his closing arguments. He restated that all through the run of lease, not a single receipt had been generated, but then, like in January, uh, in January, like mana to the Jews in the desert, a receipt magically appears. He was referencing earlier how she had called me a radical atheist, and then we had countered that with the fact that my family is Jewish and I celebrate holidays with them. <coughs> uh, I, uh, I also told him about my YouTube videos, and it's, maybe that's why she was trying to link that. But anyway, it didn't matter. The defendant of course, had the opportunity to cross-examine my tenant and myself. He asked if I had ever hit on her, and our lawyer objected successfully several times, and got him to, uh, uh, finally to, got him to restate the question. He, he thought that, the, just the, uh, that the, the question was just inappropriate and, and, not, and not suited for, the, for court. Uh, plus, it was irrelevant anyways. And that is when she told, and that is when she told that story of my ulterior motives, uh, during our lawyer's questioning of me, he had asked if I had ever hit on her, and her lawyer objected to this question as irrelevant. I, uh, the, I, I, I guess the irony was lost on him, which was quickly overruled, as it was he himself who brought it up. He also had me state what I told him during the break, my our lawyer, and I informed him the court of our homosexual relationships. 
Her lawyer objected and ordered that stricken from the record, stating that it was irrelevant to whether or not I had harassed her. Uh, uh, and our lawyer was shot back that the entire discussion was irrelevant, and the judge agreed with him and finally allowed us to move on and stop talking about this stupid thing. Although it was not stricken from the record, he, he decided that it was relevant enough. Co compare, at least to, to, co to coincide with his earlier que uh, questions to my tenant. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, I did contradict her statement that I had not told her the lease was being renewed until mid-December. Like I said, I told her in, in uh, late October, and I gave her notice on the 2nd of November. And all that was moot anyways because the lease clearly stated that it would end on the 1st of January 2016. I was asked about the receipts, and I confirmed that I had never seen them before, and that I had never received any money after December. The signatures did look like mine. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll grant him that. It did look like my signature. But uh, I, there were several times when I cleaned out my bag and I threw away, away uh, forms that did have my signature on them. So it's reasonable to assume that she could have taken them out and then used her, she has a, the exact same uh, all-in-one that I had. She could have just scanned them in and copied and pasted it. Uh, that, that was one of the things her lawyer brought up. She would ask her, do you have any uh, uh, skills with video editing and Photoshop? And she said no. But she actually, she has, uh, she has video, video editing experience. She has a YouTube channel and has made a few videos. Um, but I could do that with just a clam a shell scanner and MS Paint. It's not, it's not hard to do. <clears throat> but uh, uh, either she didn't, uh, my signature is easy enough to trace and forge simply because of the way I write. Uh, naturally, I was born a right-handed person, but I've said before I have muscular dystrophy, I also have a fine motor coordination disorder, and my right arm has become somewhat impaired. I don't have much endurance in my arm anymore. My hand has about half the grip strength as my left hand, so over the years, especially this last 10, I've learned very well to use my left. Uh, the only thing I, d I still do mo uh, about 70 to 80 percent of the time with my right hand is write on paper. But I have, I always sign with my left hand now. Just that I, I'm just, I, I, I wish I could write fluidly with my left hand. But I, I write on, I actually write on bright whiteboards and chalkboards better with my left hand than my right hand. But on paper, it's the opposite. It's, it's weird. <clears throat> so my signature, plus I never learned to write cursive. Uh, anyways, they gave up trying to teach me that in, when I was in third grade because I was. Good, because I was so bad at keeping, at, at, at just at doing it because of my motor con control disorder. So my signature is very slow and deliberate. So if, if a forger, if a forging expert was a handwriting expert was looking for a forgery, he would see it, that it was written slowly. Somebody was trying to imitate my handwriting, but that's the way I write my signature anyway. So it really wouldn't be any different in that regard. <coughs> Anyway, like, but I, ne I had never, I, I never saw the, I never wrote, I never wrote the, re never wrote the receipts, and I never, I never uh, get, received any money, and uh, one of those two receipts had a date that was handwritten, the other was typed out. The one for April was typed out. The one for January was written, and the the date looked nothing like my my handwriting, and. I was I was less than impressed by the defendant by the uh, defending lawyer's questioning of me. It really, I, I, like I, I, a lot of people imagine being in court as something that's tense and uh, uncomfortable. But I mean, when when you have the truth on your side and the person asking the questions is well sucks for a better word. Yeah, that was another thing that we noticed about him. All the other defending and uh, and defendant and plaintiff lawyers in the uh, the in the eviction court had multiple uh, cases. They, so uh, in our, we, our, we were the second or third of our, and actually, uh, our, our trial kept being, bro it was so long, it kept, be it kept being broken up for other trials, and he had two other cases that day. But her lawyer, that was the only case he was doing. That was completely unique to everyone else in there on both sides. <coughs> anyway, uh, he, the defending lawyer wanted to convince the court that I had written those receipts and had taken her money. He had me draw out my signature five times, and uh, that, was, that, that was when he pointed out the fact that I, my, my, I drew my signature slowly. He said that I, that he said in his closing argument, so that was showing that I was nervous and, and, that I was, and that I was trying to disguise my handwriting. I wasn't. 
because for the in fact they actually discussed my disability during the uh, during the trial. But he was I guess he was hoping the judge would forget that. Uh, but he when he after he was uh when he was going back to those signatures he said my favorite line from him all day. You said the signature on these receipts was similar to yours, but isn't it true that it is practically exactly like your signature? Yeah, practically exactly. I did not get much of a chance to comment on that. Uh, I started, but the lawyer, our lawyer objected successfully because I'm not qualified to examine handwriting. I'm not a handwriting expert, so I'm not qualified to answer those questions. He tried to change the question by asking uh, if the date that he said that the date he, he said that the date did look like my handwriting, and he said he asked if I had a totally unique six, and which was he was again objected or asked if it was true that the five looks like my handwriting, and again the lawyer objected to that too successfully. But the point is moot, once again, because it does not matter how unique my six was, because that definitely was not my six. There were large stretches of time during his cross-examination of me where he was just sitting at his desk, skimming through the printed out emails sent between him and my tenant, trying to come up with questions to ask me in an attempt to further attack my character and convince the judge that I am an untrustworthy person who lied about not taking her money. He asked, isn't it true that you have a pending lawsuit, uh, pending assault charge against you? And again, our lawyer objected before I could respond because it was irrelevant. <clears throat> the defendant argued to try to stop the, the objection, that he was trying to paint a picture of why she was afraid to take action against me, but not leave me. I, again, it doesn't make any sense, I know. Uh, again, she was, but she was not too afraid to leave, and it didn't fly. Besides, I've never been convicted, tried, or accused of any felony or misdemeanor. He asked if I had been in an altercation with her, and I knew exactly what he was referring to, to what he was referring, rather. In the weeks prior to the trial, while I was on the floor packing my video games, she came into the room yelling, uh, demanding to know what I did with her recyclables, accused me of stealing them uh, quite aggressively. Uh, she said it was fifty dollars worth of recyclables. It was bullshit again. I was mostly just sitting on the floor during the whole tirade. I explained to the court that with my physical disability, he asked why. Why when I told him that, uh, I, uh, he asked why I was sitting on the floor, and I, and I and I said with my physical disability, it's difficult to keep standing up and sitting down over and over again. And pack when you're packing stuff, I'm sure you can imagine that's that's what you do. I do not know why the defendant asked me that. It, the, the, the defense asked me that. It did not help this case. But when I did stand up, she started yelling at me and using my full name and screaming at me not to hit her, saying she was going to have me arrested for domestic abuse, blah, blah, blah. I never made any aggressive actions to her, and the way she kept her left hand behind her back the whole time, it was pretty obvious she was holding a recording device. And I later saw the device, and I even predicted the exact type of, the exact model of recorder it was based on the way she, was, she, she had her hand, because I, I've had recorders before. <laughs> I stayed silent the whole time and responded with only physical gestures, like uh, she was say, when she was trying to go back, she was trying to get me to confess to stealing her money from her, to, uh, the, uh, uh, those recyclables that she left in my laundry room, with, with my recyclables that I, I threw out, I recycled them, because that's what you do with shit that's left in your laundry room. <clears throat> but she, and she was saying she had only over $50, and it wouldn't have added up to even $30. I was just responding with like, you know, physical stuff that you couldn't see, <coughs> couldn't hear in recording. But so none of the recordings she made were used in court because they didn't contain any evidence in her favor. He wanted to create rationales as to why he would he thinks he would that I took her money or why or why he would he's trying to convince the court of a reasonable doubt that I did take her money. He ne he never tried to make up a reason why I supposedly gave the re her the receipts, but because he knew that they didn't make any sense. He asked. Isn't it true that you're having financial difficulties? I didn't. I don't, I don't have any financial difficulties, really. He bastardized something I had told my tenant some time ago when we were still under uh, good terms. I, I, I was just hired for a job working in China. And I've been, I've been working for that for a while. And I need to sell my house before I leave, just, uh, not because of any financial requirement to do so. I just, I'm selling my house, I'm selling my car, I'm getting rid and, of all this personal possessions that I don't need and don't want to store. Just trying, I'm just trying to reduce my footprint as much as possible. And uh, <clears throat> everything else I'm storing at my parents' house and at my friend's house. So just, 
so I just I, I'm 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 leaving the country with with literally no financial uh, responsibilities. Uh, it's not something I need to do, but it just I don't want to have to deal with anything overseas while I'm in China. But she was saying she was trying she was she was trying to convince the court that I needed to sell my house to finance a trip to China, which isn't true. I'm getting hired, and it's a job. You don't have to pay for your own job. Uh, so he wants, yeah, like I said, he wants to suggest that I took the money to help pay for the trip, and it was absurd. Uh, her one thousand dollars was really meaningless, and actually, and was actually less than the cost of having her in my house for those extra four months. I needed her out of the house. I didn't need her money. I just needed her gone. Uh, I need to get my house on the market as soon as possible. I need to get it fixed up. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on it, and I'm and I'm paying twelve hundred dollars in mortgage every month on this house, <coughs> which is actually less than the rent was in my last apartment, so it's actually not that bad of a deal. But still, I'm trying to get rid of the house. But once again, our attorney objected both times. He inquired in my personal finances on the ground that is irrelevant to the case. And once again, the objections were sustained. But really, everything was sustained, because her lawyer sucked. After cross-examining me, he brought my mother to the stand and demonstrated why it's important for lawyers to conduct research before you question somebody. You do not want someone to say something that you, that you don't know, you, that you're not expecting. When you're a lawyer, that's just, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, but even I know that much. You should have asked my father these questions, <coughs> but my mother's name was on the notice of non-renewal, so he must have assumed it was my mother who was a real estate expert. He asked her about her credentials and was caught off guard when she answered when she said she's not an agent of any kind. She answered truthfully. Her certification is that she's a registered dental hygienist. <coughs> she uh, does work for my father as a commercial mortgage underwriter, but she has a Bachelor's of Arts in Dental Hygiene that she earned in 1980. He <coughs> later tried to shift the motivation for me taking the money and hiding it from my parents by wanting to buy more video games. He, he actually, he, he asked my mom if, she, if I would have been if she would have been angry with me for taking it when, uh, and, and uh, which she said that she would not have been happy. So she was try he was trying to paint the uh, idea that uh, I took the money and hid it from them. And she asked when the last time she bought me video games and the answer to that was that my mother gifted me, my parents gifted me with an Xbox One for my 30th birthday in January. Uh, and. Uh, I mean, I don't have a, a ton of extra money to spend on things like video games, but most of the video games I buy, I buy with my own money, with just a little bit that I set aside. I, I, I wait uh, a few years after a game has come out, it comes down in price quite a bit, and I still know, and I can still get uh, copies that are used, but in very good shape. I'm a smart, I'm a smart consumer when it comes to video games. I'm a, uh, it's, it's one of my passions. I love collecting them. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, and yeah, I just said all that. <sighs> At the end of the cross-examinations of all of us, we had closing arguments. I mentioned our lawyer's closing argument earlier. The defendant's closing argument did not highlight the receipts, except to say that the bur burden of proof regarding the validity shifted to the plaintiff because they had my signature on them. But they were, they, they were not the originals anyways, and the courts weren't born yesterday. Uh, he said that my statements and behavior during the trial demonstrated that I was a very nervous and dishonest person. He said that I'm a 30-year-old man with aspirations and things I want, and that provided that I just couldn't help myself and just had to take her money during those four months. And that was it. The defendant's arguments were weak. And even, <coughs> and even the judge admitted that it did not make any sense for me to have prov provided receipts after not having done so for the duration of the lease. Uh... <laughs> Remember, one of them was dated after the eviction process had already begun. So you can imagine my surprise when the judge ruled in her favor. Yes, that's right, we lost the case. So that means she is allowed to, he decided that the lease was month to month, and uh, she is allowed to retain uh, access, uh, uh, she, she was allowed to retain possession of uh, my, my room and uh, have access to, full access to the house <coughs> and the facilities and she's not required to pay any money. In fact, we have to pay her court costs. Uh, so, yeah. 
To understand why I lost, you have to understand things about these type of trials and the laws, in, uh, especially here in California. There are disadvantages in court, both in being a landlord and having knowledge and experience in real estate. That actually, when, when a judge knows that you're experienced in this sort of thing, that makes them, that, that tends to make them think against you. That, 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 works, that, work, that does not work in your favor. The laws in California especially are very much in favor of the tenant in these cases <clears throat> because the laws were written with selfish rich landlords who want poor people out on the streets just to save a buck. And they also consider an eviction to be a greater hardship than an unlawful retainer. You also have to consider the emotional impact of the comparison between the plaintiff and the defendant. Judges are supposed to be impartial, but they're still human. On the left, he had a wealthy group of well-educated white people, and on the right, he had a poor young black girl with almost nothing to her name. In the end, though, neither the receipts nor the personal attacks on me mattered at all. The judge ruled that the amount of time she was allowed to remain before the eviction uh, implied consent, so the eviction is invalid and she was allowed to remain. You have to understand, the court is not required to take into account charities or favors to friends or the fact that she had packed some of her belongings. <coughs> not taking action immediately, and I mean immediately after the lease expired, sunk us. That was the only thing he, he, he officially considered. After the trial, she continued to harass me in my own home. She was openly recording me and threatening to take me to civil court. It was obviously an intolerable situation, situation, so the decision was made for me to move into my parents' house for the time being. And that's where I am right now. I spent some time last month in Los Angeles working and teaching computer science to kids, and now I've just been hired to teach English in China, and so I'm preparing for that. Don't worry, I'll still be making videos from overseas. I know they have some restrictions there, but I have, I have my ways. We have filed a new 60-day eviction, and her father has now completely moved in, to my, during my absence. So now, now we have squatters in the house. And they can choose, the, they can still choose to fight it. There's, there's, they have options. They can file another unlaw, unlawful eviction. They can try to file a bankruptcy. And when it happened, the court stops everything. So the eviction stops and uh, <clears throat> they have to go through and then we have to wait until the courts uh, will hear that, which could take more, which could take a month, two months, even more. And then, assuming they lose that, then they get 14 days before they're, lock before they're locked out. And then uh, anything, any of their possessions that, are, that cost less than seven, anything that costs more than $700, which I think is just the, uh, a mattress set, that's the only thing that I've seen of, of, their, of hers that looks like it has any sort of value, that has to go to an auction. And everything else we can just throw out, which I'll take great pleasure in doing when, uh, if the opportunity presents it. <clears throat> now, the burning question here is why? What motivation would, ha would someone have to do this to someone, let alone a friend who had bent over backwards for them? Her father definitely is not right, and I pity her because, because of it. I, I thought that she, had the, that she loved him because he was her father and she had to deal with his, his issues. I had no idea that she was just as bad. But assuming she's not psychotic? How does she justify her actions? How does she not feel bad about what she's doing? I can't say for any certainty what goes on in someone else's mind, but I have never ceased to be amazed by the compartmentalization, the projection, the rationalization, and self-deception that people are capable of. <coughs> she may have convinced herself that I deserved this somehow, that, that I did harass her, that I was an asshole. There are also certain feelings and that develop between in a relationship that is an economic disparity. On my side, it, it was uh, it, it's why I was obviously far more understanding and patient than I should have been. On the other hand, she's seen how I live. She's seen how my parents live. Maybe she thinks that oh, look at this spoiled rich boy. What does he know about hardship? Maybe she uses that as justification for anything she does to me because. Uh, anything, maybe she uses that as justification for anything she does to me because I have two living parents. They can help me. Uh, they, I, can, I have career aspects. I have money in my bank account. And therefore, everything she has to deal with is far worse. It's, <clears throat> it's an extension of that privilege argument. But the problem with, the, with privilege is that it makes assumptions about people's past simply by making superficial observations of their present. My parents are relatively successful and they live comfortably. 
they've been willing and able to provide very well for my sister, myself, and even my and even my nephew, my my their, their grandchild. My sister has one uh, one son, and she has another baby on the way. And my parents have helped her out far more than they were obligated to. But they had to work very hard for it. My dad, he he's disabled too. It, it, disabled different in different ways than I am. <coughs> And he was a victim of discrimination. So he lacks any of the degrees or diplomas of any kind. He completed the requirements for his high school diploma, but his principal refused to present it to him simply because he didn't like him. My father has become a jack of all trades. He had to learn a lot of different skills to get by without any proof of education. In the early 80s, he started a new business with his father. And my grandfather retired a few years later, shortly before I was born. He, he expanded his commercial property management business to include, include commercial mortgage refinancing. He studied <coughs> and got himself a broker's license. Not an easy thing. I've seen the stuff he has to study. He has to, to learn. My mother stopped working in dental, in dental offices while she was pregnant with me and began helping my dad. They filed articles of, of corporation but remain a privately owned company. Their mortgage brokering business is recognized and respected nationwide. As for me, I'm grateful for the assistance my parents have given me, but to think that I've not had to work that I've not had to work hard for what I have is absurd. I have both physical and learning disorders, which made getting through college much more difficult. I changed majors twice, but I have always been in one STEM field or another. And most people studying those fields do not work full time more than ten hours a week. I've always had I've almost always had, there's been a couple of times when I was unemployed. <coughs> Uh, I've, always, I've almost always had one to three part-time jobs simultaneously, plus I have three student loans that I have to start paying back at the end of the year, which I'm actually planning on doing all at once before I leave. I, <coughs> I don't think I'm going to have enough money left in my bank by the time I leave, but I was planning on doing so with, with the profits from selling my house and my van, but I may have to do that overseas or leave my parents as executors of my estate and allow them to, to pay it off for me which I really don't want to do, I, prefer, I, I could easily do it myself if I just had the opportunity. <clears throat> but even any assumptions about how much more comfortable my life has been than hers, uh, despite those, it does not give anyone the right to steal from me and disrupt my life. It does not make me any less deserving of anything I've accomplished, nor does it make me more deserving of any harm or any strife. I know this was a very long video, and I appreciate all those who have stuck with it this far, but this last part is the most important. What is it that can be learned from my experiences? First off, it does not matter who you are or who is moving in with you, always do everything by the book. Have a lease. Make sure it is signed and dated by all parties. Make sure it's very detailed. My lease contained a description of the condition of the space she was occupying and made her liable for any damages. It forbade her from bringing in unauthorized guests, which she violated. I could have evicted her then, and should have. Uh, and lots of other things. No smoking, blah, blah, blah. Uh, when to pay, the, how much the, the pay, when to pay. I had the advantage of my parents' experience, but there are help and sample forms available on the California government website covering evictions, renewals, leases, etc. Another thing to remember. Keep a paper trail. If I had given her certified documents at regular intervals alerting her that she was in default of the lease, she probably would not have won the court case. Uh, hold them to that lease. Always hold them to the letter of their lease. <coughs> if it ends or they violate it, evict them. It is your house. It is your property. It is your risk. They are not entitled to any of it no matter how dire their situation is. If they do not understand or respect that, then they are not good people. My parents have taken me in. I've paid them $3,000, but there's no time limit or lease of any kind. I am planning on moving next month to China, but my belongings are here, and since I had to get a new license and wanted it sent here for safekeeping, uh, just so, because I didn't I want the risk of being stolen again, I had to have my parents' address put on it. So I have plenty of evidence to prove residency. And if I was that kind of person, I could make my parents' lives miserable, and they would have to wait months to evict me. <clears throat> I'm required to leave my dishes and a lot of my appliances in the house. Everything that she used <coughs> while the, during the, the time of the lease, she has to have, have continued access to. 
huh, so like my laundry facilities, I had to pay for internet. Even though she's not using it, the, I, when the times I've had access to my house to get more stuff out, it's, been, it's remained unplugged the entire time. But I still, but if I do not, if I disconnect the internet, I have to pay $200 a day when the internet is not, is not connected. So in conclusion, please remember to protect yourself. You, you might think that you have ultimate control over your own home, but you do not. Anyone who claims residency in your property cannot be forced out without lengthy court proceedings. Because the laws are designed foremost to protect people from losing their, their roof over their heads, and not to protect the people who own those roofs. Roofs. Thank you.